I'm here uh, to talk for a very short time about a very big book, if you've seen it, covering a very, very, very big subject. I always begin talks about the book the way I began the book itself with a flashback to a very important election year. The country was bitterly divided politically, imagine that. It was threatened from abroad. Its president, first name George, was embattled and very unpopular at this particular point. It was 1796, and borrowing from the book of Micah, President Washington yearned for a time when his nation would have the strength of a giant and none shall make us afraid. A little more than 200 years later, at the dawn of the 21st century, the United States had achieved that position of world power Washington could not have dreamed of. Pundits hailed a unipolar moment, a time when there was only one major nation operating in the world. Comparisons were drawn with ancient Rome, the only historical example that seemed adequately to describe America's preeminence uh, in the 1990s and at the turn of the 21st century. My book tells the story of America's rise from colonies along the Atlantic coast uh, to a commanding position in world politics and economics. Uh, it's the only topical volume in the Oxford series. It covers all of US history. Somebody asked me recently, do you deal with the colonial period? And I said, no, thank God. That was one thing I was kind of able to leave out. As such, it posed the truly formidable and indeed at times quite intimidating challenge of synthesizing a huge, great expanse of scholarly literature uh, into a single volume, albeit a big one, uh, in a style appealing to non-specialists. And, and I'll be the first to admit that it took roughly 12 years. I wasn't working on it the whole time. The problem, of course, is every day I don't get it done. Uh, things happen again that have to be added in later, uh, so it was a great challenge. The joy of doing the book, on the other hand, was the opportunity after roughly 40 years of teaching and writing about this subject to try to pull it all together in uh, some meaningful fashion. And it was great, great fun in ways I hadn't imagined. It was great, great fun uh, after all these years each day to learn something new. I mean, really, it's with history, of course, I think it was Harry Truman who said the, the only thing new in the world is your history you don't know. And uh, every day there was something new, uh, new insight or new information, and it, that was great fun. And maybe you can, uh, after all, teach an old dog a few new tricks. Now, America's rise to global preeminence is, uh, I think, a fabulous story. It's a story of restless settlers pushing out against weak restraints, uh, of explorers, adventurers, merchants, missionaries, carrying American ways to new lands. It includes filmmakers and other agents of what has been called the nation's soft power, our cultural influence, the power of our ideals. Even a voice of America disc jockey, a man by the name of Willis Conover, who waged the Cold War with jazz and who was said to have been more powerful uh, than a fleet of B-29 bombers. It analyzes countless crises, some of them border on comic opera. An 1893 near war with Chile, for example, provoked by a fight between US sailors properly drunk, their captain insisted. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, and Chileans uh, in Valparaiso's Blue Moon Saloon. Uh, others are absolutely harrowing. The much written about Cuban Missile Crisis, which many of you may uh, remember. One example, and a lesser known incident in 1983, when nuclear war may have been averted only by the bold and timely intervention of a uh, of a Red Army colonel. And what a wonderful cast of characters. Statesmen like George Washington, one of my personal favorites, uh, the nation's greatest Secretary of State, I think John Quincy Adams, 
Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and on and on and on. On the other side, there are also rogues and rascals. I love the 19th century because all of the wonderful characters. The first ugly Americans, example. Joel Poinsett of near neighboring South Carolina, better known for giving his name to a Christmas flower, and Anthony Butler, both of whom as U.S. ministers to Mexico, treated their host country with contempt and shamelessly meddled in its internal affairs. All too typical, I regret to say, of the type of diplomat we sent to Latin America through much of the 19th century. One of my favorite characters, the notorious lawyer, doctor, journalist, and soldier of fortune, William Walker, 120 pounds of dynamite, the gray-eyed man of destiny, he was called, who managed to get himself elected president of Nicaragua, was thrown out of office, made three tries uh, to retain his office, and finally was assassinated in uh, Honduras. Not known to many North Americans, but his name still conjures up all sorts of memories and images in, uh, in Nicaragua. Eccentrics uh, like Naval Officer Charles Wilkes, who commanded the great United States exploring expedition in the 1840s and somehow managed to promote himself to captain while at sea. You couldn't do that when I was in the Navy, but he Things were a little looser. Promotion procedures a little looser in those days, I guess. In 1861, the imperious Wilkes um, provoked an incident at sea, the so-called Trent Affair, uh, which nearly provoked war with Britain in the early stages of the Civil War. And you can imagine the possible consequences. It's hard to imagine the possible consequences of that. A diplomat such as Benjamin Franklin, one of America's first envoys and perhaps its best, a master propagandist, publicist, whose image, uh, it was said in 1777, appeared on snuff boxes, rings, medals, bracelets, even on an envious Louis, Louis, uh, King Louis chamber pot. And it was Franklin, of course, who persuaded a wary French court to support the United States with uh, money, supplies, and ultimately men, crucial to the success of the revolution. Uh, Townsend Harris, uh, a very important diplomat who in the 1860s, through sheer persistence and cultural sensitivity, managed to persuade a very reluctant Japanese government to grant trade concessions to the United States uh, banker turned diplomat Dwight Morrow, who in marked contrast to most of his predecessors, set out to like Mexicans and managed to negotiate a treaty in the 1920s, solving some very difficult problems, much of it centered around oil. People from other countries also make up this uh, cast of characters, of course. Uh, the French foreign minister, Vergen, who is the one mainly who decides to assist the Americans in, in uh, 1776, 7, and 8. Uh, a very important decision for both the United States and France. It has a huge impact on France. Uh, Alexander McGillivray, Tecumseh, and his half-brother, the Prophet, Native Americans who try both diplomacy and war in a futile effort to thwart U.S. expansion. The mercurial Antonio de Padua, Maria, Cerevino Lopez de Santa Anta y Perez de Lebron, better known as Santa Anta to North Americans, 11 times president of Mexico, who wept openly when he was shown a map detailing the amount of territory uh, that country lost to the United States after the Mexican-American War uh, in, uh, in 18, 1846. Uh, Emilio Aguinaldo, youth, youthful leader of Filipino insurgents, uh, David Lloyd George and Clemenceau, Wilson's allies and adversaries in Paris negotiating the Treaty of Versailles, Churchill and Stalin with FDR, the big three of, of, uh, of World War II. One of my favorites, first time I and many of you all remember very well, and the more we learn about him, the more terrifying he is, Nikita Khrushchev, who once likened diplomacy to playing chess in the dark. And of course, he's playing with nuclear weapons. 
When he came to, the, to Geneva for the summit in 1955, he was mortified that, that his plane was so much smaller than Dwight Eisenhower's plane. So he made sure that the next time it was different. And when he arrived in the United States in 1959 for a, an official visit, his plane was humongous. It was the biggest airplane to be found in those days. 50 feet off the ground, it was so tall that they couldn't find one of these rolling ladders that you could put up to the door where you could walk off. The, the passengers, including all these Soviet dignitaries and Khrushchev himself, had to tumble out of a, an emergency ladder at the rear of the aircraft. Okay, it's impossible to summarize a thousand pages in a few minutes. Uh, I, I, that's for sure. But what I want to do in the short time remaining is to, to talk really about three different themes that run through the book and I think have relevance and importance for us today. First, from the start, more than I think even I had realized when I started this book, foreign policy has been absolutely central to the national experience. Example after example, the Declaration of Independence had many different goals, but one of the most crucial was to persuade friendly European powers, Britain's enemies obviously, that the Americans were serious about their revolution and therefore worthy of assistance. And of course aid from France and other European powers was absolutely crucial to America's success in the revolution. And you could go on and on example after example. The nation's survival of the War of 1812, and it was a very close run thing, validated a still very tenuous Republican uh, experiment. Uh, Lincoln and William Seward's skillful combination of bluster and conciliation uh, helped ensure, uh, help prevent foreign intervention during the Civil War, thus ensuring a Union victory, and even more important and less recognized, ensuring the emergence of a great power. Once the issue of Union was settled, then it was inevitable that the United States would emerge as a major power, a great power among the great powers of the world. Uh, during the nation's second century and beyond, foreign policy became even more critical to the nation's prosperity and security. The enduring idea of an isolationist America, still found in some U.S. history textbooks, is a myth, and I think it's a myth that's sometimes used, conveniently used to sort of protect the nation's image of itself, uh, of its innocence. In fact, from 1776 on, the United States has been an active and influential player in world affairs, and foreign policy has had a huge impact on American life. We might at times wish the world would go away, and maybe now is one of those times, but it never has, it never will, and for the most part, I think we haven't wanted it to. Next point is a tad complicated, but, but bear with me. From 1776, uh, Americans have seen themselves as a distinctly different people, a people apart. They believe that their nation has a special destiny. The revolutionary generation rebelled not only against Britain, but also against old world ways of doing things. They rejected European style power politics. They saw themselves as heralds of a novo, novus ordo seclorum, a new order for the ages in which the sort of enlightened diplomacy practiced by Americans uh, would lead to a new international system much more, uh, much more friendly to the needs and interests of all people than to the selfish needs of kings and courts. From Massachusetts Bay Colony founder John Winthrop's call for a city on a hill through Thomas Jefferson and Woodrow Wilson to Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, Americans have seen themselves as a chosen people with a providential mission. God's American Israel, the Puritans called it. 
They have prided themselves on their unique innocence and virtue, the most moral and generous people on earth, in Reagan's words. They have claimed for themselves a special obligation to extend the blessings of freedom to others. Now, I think on the one side, this idea of providential mission has spurred a drive to do good in the world, manifested in the work of merchants, missionaries, educators, Individual citizens, incidentally, are often the advanced agents of U.S. foreign policy. Certainly the ideal undergirded Woodrow Wilson's dream of the United States as a world leader uh, and of a world reformed according to American principle. But I think this sense of special destiny and mission has had another side. It has produced a certain arrogance. Uh, it has produced a, uh, a tendency or an easiness to justify aggressive uh, acquisitiveness. Convinced of our superiority, righteousness, and destiny, 19th century Americans had no difficulty rationalizing pushing Native Americans steadily westward to the point of extinction. They had no difficulty rationalizing taking uh, a good chunk of Mexico's territory by effectively exploiting the land for agriculture, American apologists insisted, they used it properly. Indians and Mexicans did not. The territory acquired would create more land for refugees from oppression on other, country, on other continents was also a rationale uh, commonly used. In the 1890s, convictions of Anglo-Saxon superiority enabled proponents of overseas expansion to justify imposing imperial control on the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii, and protectorates on numerous Caribbean nations. America's new manifestation, uh, manifest destiny in the 1890s was to school lesser people in the benefits of civilization and prepare them for eventual self-government. The white man's burden, as Rudyard Kipling called it. Uh, and it's not generally recognized that uh, Kipling coined this phrase in 1899 when he was urging the United States to take up the burden of colonial control of the Philippine island. This leads to a second major point that ironically, despite our distinctive approach to the world, our disdain for old world diplomacy, our claims to moral superiority, the United States throughout much of its history has behaved more like a traditional great power than we have prepared to admit or, or recognize. We have energetically pursued and zealously protected interests deemed vital. In terms of commerce and territory, we have been aggressively and relentlessly expansion, uh, expansionist. When the hunger for land was sated, uh, we have extended our economic and political influence throughout much of the world. During the Cold War, the United States blatantly interfered in the, in the name of national security, interfered in the internal affairs of other countries overthrew popularly elected governments in Guatemala in 1954, in Iran in 1953, and even plotted the assassination of foreign leaders like Patrice Lumumba and Fidel Castro. So from the founders of the 18th century to the Cold Warriors 200 years later, Americans have played the great game of world politics, uh, a game they have often disparaged, uh, with sometimes ruthless skill. Number three, popular notions to the contrary. The United States has been spectacularly successful in its foreign policy. Now, I know that statement is going to jar your ears. Who is that revisionist nut standing up there, uh, you ask? Liberal or conservative, we tend to obsess about our foreign policy failures. There's an old saying dated back to the early 20th century that the United States never lost a war or won a peace. However good we are at military things, we've been pretty much a failure in uh, diplomacy. Such notions reflect, I think, first, the nation's traditional disdain for diplomacy. 
is preference for seemingly more manly and decisive military solutions. I think they also reflect a fundamental misunderstanding of the limits of diplomacy in war. By its very nature, diplomacy rarely produces the sort of clear-cut, definitive solutions that we Americans prefer. And even when wars are won decisively, as with World War II, they can often have unfavorable, unintended consequences. There's one law in war that always works, and that's the law of unintended consequences. Such nations, uh, notions also, I think, reflect a myopic view of U.S. history. To be sure, like all countries and all people, the United States has made huge mistakes and suffered colossal failures, oftentimes with tragic consequences for us and for other peoples as well. Uh, rejection of the League of Nations, the Bay of Pigs, uh, interventions in Iran and Guatemala, which seemed like great successes to those who knew about them in 53 and 54, produced long-term disasters. The Vietnam War, obviously, the war in Iraq, even if it turns out all right, which is still an uncertain prospect, may still be judged a failure because of the dubious premises upon which it was launched and because it deflected attention and resources away from the more urgent and immediate task in Afghanistan. This said, the nation, I think, has a record of overall record of achievement with little precedent in history. In the space of a little over 200 years, the United States conquered a continent, established dominance over the Caribbean and Pacific Ocean areas, tipped the scales toward allied victory in two world wars, prevailed in a half-century Cold War, and extended its economic influence, military might, uh, popular culture, and soft power throughout much of the world. By the beginning of the 21st century, it had attained that strength of a giant that George Washington had longed for in 1796. Yet ironically, here's the catch, even as it grew more powerful, the limits to its power became more palpable, a harsh reality for which we as a people were not by any means prepared by history. Our remarkable success produced what a British commentator called the illusion of American omnipotence, the idea uh, that we could do anything we set our mind to, the difficult we do tomorrow, it was said, the impossible could take a while. Success was taken for granted. Failure caused great frustration, and when it occurred, often we tend to blame ourselves rather than accept even or acknowledge or look in the face the notion that there are limits to what we can do in the world. The emergence of a new 21st century threat in the form of international terrorism, the devastation of 9-11, underscored another hard reality that power alone does not guarantee security. The greater a nation's influence, the greater its capacity to provoke anger and envy, the more overseas interest a nation has, the more targets it presents to foes, the more it has to defend, creating huge cost in the form of what has been called imperial overstretch. Our unparalleled power, the strength of a giant, could not assure the freedom from fear that George Washington had talked about in 1796. And the unipolar moment, it is now clear, turned out to be stunningly, stunningly brief. When I began work, serious work on this book in 1997, the United States was nearing the pinnacle of its post-Cold War power. When I finished it early this year, U.S. economic and military power had declined sharply, and its soft power, the strength of its ideals, had significantly eroded. In part, I think this was self-inflicted. Uh, certain decisions in terms of taxation and government spending, uh, the decision to go into Iraq uh, with, without war taxes of any kind, uh, some of the policies developed during the course of Iraq all had the effect of 
of uh, decreasing America's power and influence in the world instead of increasing it as the hope and the intention had been. Yet our changing position in the world also reflected, I think, fundamental changes that were going on in the world contemporaneously. The United States remained the world's greatest military power, to be sure, but that power was stretched thin, as we're now painfully, uh, uh, painfully recognized. Uh, while we were bogged down in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, China and the European Union emerged as economic competitors. Uh, Russia, India, and Bra uh, Brazil and the Arab oil states emerged as important second-tier powers. Pundits began by late last year to speak of the United States in decline. Some spoke of the rise of the rest, meaning non-Western nations mainly, uh, and even the end of the era of the white man world affairs. It's quite unclear at this point to throw another factor in what havoc the current financial crisis that we're going through now may wreck on, the, on international economic and world politics. How will nations respond to this? Uh, will they try to work together? Or as during the Depression, will they sort of pull in an economic competition, breed political competition, and in time uh, produce war? What is clear is that our new president, whoever that may be, will face problems as grave as any administration coming into power, probably since FDR in 1933, and he will have few instruments at hand to address them. Uh, my son heard me talk similar the other night and said, Dad, God, you ended on such a sour, pre pre uh, pessimistic, depressing note. Can you perk it up a little bit. And, uh, well, the only thing I can say in that regard, things for the immediate future don't look uh, happy or optimistic, but I think uh, this country over time has shown its resilience, and I'm reasonably confident that that will manifest itself again. What it is going to require, I think, is, is, is working closely with other countries in ways we haven't done perhaps in the past. Uh, it's going to require uh, patience. Diplomacy is not easy. It takes time. What it produces are often uh, unclear and unto their murky solutions rather than, than clear and lasting solutions. Uh, this is not going to be like the post-World War II era when we stood above all other nations in terms of our power and influence. We're going to have to work with other nations as equal. We're going to have to get used to working uh, in a world where we may not necessarily be called uh, calling the shots. We've been here before. It's interesting for those who remember something of the 1980s, that there was much talk and moaning and groaning about decline then. Paul Kennedy wrote a book almost as thick as mine, bestseller. That's the difference, I guess. Uh, the only reason it was a bestseller because the last 30 pages talked about the United States in decline. I can't imagine that people read the other 850 or what, but they did read that it was those last pages. That was only uh, like, what, 20 years ago. And look what happened in the interim. We've, we've ascended to the heights and then come down again. So these things are constantly changing. I hope that my book, by showing where we have been can help in some small way uh, help us see where we are and maybe even where we need to go. I don't pretend to have the solutions to today's uh, most pressing problems, uh, but I hope that the work I've done will shed a bit of light on them. Uh, a recent blurb writer began his endorsement of a new book on international relations by saying that reading foreign policy tomes is seldom included among life's pleasures. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> that hurt. But the writer went on to describe the book he was blurbing as a startling exception, and I hope my book, if not startling, will be an exception, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it this evening. Thanks much. I, 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 uh,
what do you want time wise? What do you want to? Yeah, the, the exact words. I don't know that I used them, but you got them. Yeah. Could you start with an easier one than that? <laughs> no, that's a great, great question. I've thought about that a lot. And I, you know, you can, you can see in the debates that that, uh, that there has been this mantra: America has been a force for good in the world. Like this, and yeah, sure it has. But there's a whole other part to the story. I don't know. I think the tendency that what we may face in the immediate future is is less uh, restraining those exceptionalists and militarism is a strong word, and I guess uh, the military tendency on a euphemize, uh, make a euphemism out of it, that may be less the problem in the immediate future than resisting the impulse to pull in. Because generally, in the aftermath of failed or frustrating wars or wars with outcomes that are ambivalent at best, uh, and in times of financial crisis, we've tended to pull in. So that, uh, that could be a problem. I don't know how uh, I think it's going to take a person of rare eloquence and persuasive power to accomplish what you do, and in the case of Obama, I think it's going to be very hard for. It would be easier for McCain to do something like that. I don't think he. I don't think he believes it first. I think he believes strongly in, in American exceptionalism, and I think he believes strongly in use of military power. But it would be easier for him to do something like that than it, but then like it was for Nixon to go to China. So I don't know. I don't have any good answer to that. But I think it's a. I think reconsidering that, or as journalist or Orville Schell said the other night, sort of renegotiating it or redefining it uh, is the first step in moving towards sort of, you know, the problems we face by and large are international problems, no matter what, what you call them. I mean, you know, which problem you're talking about. And we can't solve, we can take the leadership, uh, but I think we, and even in taking the leadership, I think we have to cool the rhetoric a little bit. And that's, that's already happening to some extent. But to come out and say, yeah, yeah that's tough. Yes. <laughs> on, on the continent of Europe, yeah, exactly. Well, perhaps, but uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how you. The balance of power is a little tricky right now because I, they're not. I mean, the British were always talking about alliances and that sort of thing, and outside of NATO, there really there's no existing alliance, uh, major alliance in the world. So, I, yeah, we we're not. You know, the bottom line is, and I hate to say this. Bottom line is when we learn from history, we usually learn the wrong things. We're, we're, we're always looking for lessons. And, and the deal is that most of the time politicians are using history. What are they using it for? Back up their position. Yeah. So you've got, if you want to be tough, you've got the Munich analogy. 
if you want the other side, it's the Vietnam analogy. And sometimes they're at war with each other as they were over intervention in the 90s. So anytime anybody starts talking about the lessons of history, uh, I run for cover. Uh, I know it's going to be bad. Trying to get perspective is what we need, and I think that's what you're suggesting. And uh, there, there are not too many leaders. George Marshall was a singular figure in so many ways. He wasn't a historian by any means, but he, he had read history and he had a wonderful sense of history. And I think a lot, I think that's what we need. How we get it is uh, teach better history, I guess, in school. Yes. I can give you any kind of examples you want. I can give you examples of disasters, and I can give you examples of it working very well. So, you know, there again, it's a case of, of you can find pretty much want, what you want to find in it. Uh, but but all, every, every case is different. Every case, I think the thing you have to emphasize about history and historical examples is that every, every case has its own unique context. And that's why in looking at history and trying to, to make history useful, we need to look for similarities, but we also need to look for differences. We can learn as much from the differences as we can from the similarities. I think the important thing about meeting with people is that we need to, to know the people as well as we can. We need to prepare carefully. Uh, we need to have a pretty good idea of what we want. We need not to expect too much, uh, uh, but you know, do do we go back and find? We I can find any kind of example you want to justify my, the, what I think is the McCain-Palin position and what I think is the Obama position. Yes. Yeah, yeah, gotten a lot more so. Can you imagine what the example I love there is uh, Thomas Jefferson sends James Monroe to Paris. Eight, I'm bad on dates. 1803, I think that's that's close, give or take here. 1803, to buy New Orleans. You know, they think Napoleon's going to be ready to buy, uh, to sell New Orleans. What does Napoleon do? He offers all of Louisiana, which is not the state of Louisiana, which we know and love now, but everything from the Mississippi to the Rockies. And does James Monroe have the chance to you know, call or wire Jefferson and say, hey, Tom, what do I do now? You know, I've got this great deal out. No, he has to make a decision. That was a relatively easy decision when you got a bargain like that going. But now, now it, the tendency now, diplomats don't have anywhere near the leverage or independence they once had. Um, it's a whole different game now. And it gets, you know, more so every year with technology. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a, obviously it's a very complex process, and uh, I mean, we can say that it's the president acting on the advice of the National Security Council and the national security bureaucracy, which is huge, but obviously, as we know, it's more complex than that because uh, what we, uh, the public, think has some influence, what other nations are doing has influence. Uh, it's a very, very complicated process. The media may have some influence. Uh, Congress may have some influence. Sometimes it's sort of a, a negative influence or a re restraining influence, but uh, it's a very, very complicated process, and it's going to vary from administration to administration, at least in terms of government, depending on how that government, uh, how that acts. It can be, as with Franklin Roosevelt, an incredibly haphazard process. He thrived on chaos. 
uh, he would appoint two or three people who he knew didn't like each other to do the same problem and then watch them fight and love it. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it was disastrous. Truman, on the other hand, had a very, ran a very tight ship and an orderly process, and, and people reported up through the line to him, and it was very, the channels were clear. Uh, mostly it depends on, if you're talking about the process at the top, it depends on personalities, I think, more than organization charts and that sort of thing. But it's, it's a very complex process, I think, is the bottom line. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I missed the first part, and I. Yeah. 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 I. That's. There was a time in the in the immediate post Cold War period in the 1890. I mean the 1990s when it looked like the UN was gonna gonna be the agent. It was gonna be what it's. Uh, what its uh, planners had conceived it to be in 1945. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way, and and I must I can't be too optimistic. I think it uh, it can be useful when people want it to be useful, uh, but that that just doesn't happen often. So uh, we would like uh, we would hope and like that that there would be cases where it could play critical roles, but unfortunately over the last, uh, what, 60 some odd years, it just hasn't worked out that way. Maybe it's time to restructure it in some way. Uh, there's been talk from time to time about some effort to restructure it and try to see if you can come up with a way to make it work better. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that's gonna go anywhere. You know, international politics is a tough game and people just are not prepared to, as we weren't prepared in 1919 and weren't prepared actually with the UN after 1945, are not prepared, they're prepared to, to let the UN do things that aren't important to them. But they, they can't be sure of outcomes and they're very reluctant to make that sort of commitment. The whole, I mean, what we've got now, it, it's not just transnational corporation, the political scientists call them, what, non-state actors, I think, is the, is the thing. Uh, but you've got all kinds of independent actors out there who aren't, uh, aren't uh, responsible to any particular government or country or to any particular constituency except themselves. And, they're non-governmental organizations which are doing good work. They're terrorist organizations. They're uh, transnational corporations which uh, have a huge impact on uh, international economics. Not always in ways that we would like. Are there ways to regulate them? Well, we haven't been regulating inside the country very well. Uh, so the chances of that happening are pretty slim too. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think it has. Uh, I think it has affected it from the beginning in ways that that I talked about tonight. Uh, this sense of ourselves as a chosen people, uh, with a special God-given mission. I think this has been an influence. There have been uh, particular individuals in which the religious influence has been particularly powerful. Woodrow Wilson was certainly one of them. A, a minister's Presbyterian minister's son whose idea of America as a world leader and himself as an American leader was shot through with uh, religious, uh, with religious uh, undertones. Uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, George Bush. Um, I don't know that I would take it further than that. I, I, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I guess I would have some problems with thinking of us as a Christian nation. We're a nation made up of many different people and many different religions. 
in which Christianity has had a considerable impact. But uh, we have stopped there for any any other. Was there was somebody? Did I miss somebody over here? Yeah. As an old white guy, uh, I don't think that's altogether bad. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that the diversity of the country, and and it it has become so much different so fast. I think many different things have had the foreign policy things have had an impact on the United States over the last fifty years. But I don't think anything had any bigger in impact than. Lyndon Johnson's 1965-66 Immigration Act, which reversed the 1924 Act and and sort of opened the way for what's happened, and it's changed the the uh, character of this country considerably. I, I think it will continue to change it, and its foreign policy is going to be uh, impacted here gradually. How I have no idea, but it's going to have an impact. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 We do. We do. Yeah. I know. I know. No. We. That was among the group that I work with. We have huge differences among us. Huge differences. So yeah. Uh, I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other, any others? All right. Thank you. Thank you.